Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Newton Wellesley Medical Group Lunch and Learn. Today, we are really happy to have coaxed Dr. Ann Wang Dolan to come talk to us about um, an allergy related topic for which she's chosen inactive ingredients are not inactive. Um, for those of you who've been around the community for a while, like I have, Dr. Wang Doman has been taking care of our patients for many years um, in her very unique uh, fashion and pediatric and adult patients. So I'm thankful for that. And I'm also thankful for her coming um, and giving us this talk. Next slide, please. Some introductory slides before we let her get going. First, upcoming lunch and learns. We have a non-intrinsic shoulder pain coming up next week. Um, following week, we have death taxes and carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and then following that, um, a nice um, broad topic on um, ophthalmological care, cataracts and corneal surgeries uh, for the primary care doc. Um, as you all know, these talks are all uh, posted up on our intranet as well as on YouTube. Go ahead on YouTube and search Newton Wellesley Medical Group Lunch and Learn to see any old versions of any older talks. Next slide, please, Anne. Oh yeah, we wanted to make people aware that we now offer as part of our virtual fitness training program, a free on-site um, virtual fitness training for individuals or groups. This is online coaching for individuals or groups, for physicians and APPs. This comes out of our wellness grant. This is money that we need to spend on you. So please sign up for this. Daniel and his team are willing, are ready and willing to set you guys up. Um, for any APP or physician on staff, please take advantage of this. Um, as he says, get your workout on and go ahead and email him with any questions. Next slide. The Physician Care Concierge Program or Circles Concierge Program is still up and running through the end of November. This is something we paid for for you already. Please take advantage of this. This is like having a, a, a valet at your service. Anything you need done to yourself, to your house, um, to your property, um, they can point you in the right direction. They can make appointments for you. Um, all through email or text, however you like to set it up. Um, it's a very, it's a great service and it's uh, there for you and a plus one. All you need to do is go to community.circles.com and then put NWH as the welcome code and you will get uh, free service all the way through the end of November. Next slide. Upcoming um, opioid uh, treatment, opioid addiction and, and managed substance use disorders, half and half X waiver training. A lot of us have done this training already. We wanted to make people aware that the registration deadline is coming up in a couple of weeks, and it's going to be Wednesday, June 22nd, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, we are all the target audiences for this. Please go ahead and sign up for that. This is a great, great training, even if you don't prescribe um, narcotics, just to know about Suboxone and how it works. Next slide. And I'll hand it over to Ann. Just unmute yourself, Ann, so you can go ahead and take off. There you go. All right, do you hear me? Hi, uh, thanks, John, for that nice introduction. And welcome everybody who's um, attending my talk. I have to say, I really enjoy putting the talk together. And I am located at Newton Wellesley. Um, and I see pediatric and adult allergy patients. So why did I, first of all, choose this topic? Well, my patients are my teachers. And I find that when they come to see me with their problems, I become their detective. And it's so important to me that I try to find causes, the triggers for their presenting problem. And these days, it's kind of awful that I'm seeing so many people reacting to their medicines that they have been prescribed or they on their own take, you know, like vitamins and supplements too. And, um, this is where the detective work is so important. So as you can imagine, there's so many inactive ingredients and there's so many medicines, vitamins and supplements, including vaccines too. Um, so what I'm gonna do is narrow down um, the list and, and talk about um, some of the more common troublemakers and present to you some interesting cases that I've seen. So I'm going to hone in on lactose, which is a huge trigger for problems of various types. And then also, you know, in that category of food, I didn't list it, but cornstarch can be in pills and sometimes soybean oil, like in Flovent inhaler. But I'll hone in on lactose and then some of the chemical agents. As you know, color dyes can cause trouble. That's pretty obvious. 
And more recently, the hot topic seems to be polyethylene glycol and polysorbate of various types because largely the COVID vaccine and, and also they're found in medicines. So first of all, how can symptoms and signs present? If somebody is reacting, allergic reaction, it, it doesn't matter what kind of mechanism, IgE or not, um, it's some sort of inflammatory condition. So they can have dermatitis, which would present as rash or sometimes swelling, more commonly rash and itching. And then you can also have patients who present with like chronically runny nose, rhinitis, or lower down in the chest. So that could be coughing, chronic coughing, sometimes even wheezing, because by definition, asthma is an inflammatory condition. These days, I'm seeing so many people present with GI symptoms, and that could be abdominal pain or abdominal bloating, discomfort, diarrhea and or constipation. GERD is another one. Or they come and they say, I have IBS, which is, a, in my opinion, a wastebasket term, which is mediated by inflammation. And once in a while, I have also seen people with arthritic symptoms, arthritis, and um, it can be due to whatever they're ingesting. Now that's less common, but I, I will talk more about all of this. I like to present some interesting cases. So this case goes way back to January of 2000. And it was a gentleman named Stephen who had no history of allergies, no history of gastrointestinal issues, but he did develop hyperlipidemia on a checkup. So back then we could prescribe Lipitor. So he started taking a tiny Lipitor 10 milligram tablet in January of 2000, once a day. And by June, he was in our emergency room here with severe abdominal pain. So the diagnosis that every thought he had was appendicitis, but all of his tests, and he had you know, also radiologic studies and the surgeon was even call did not point to appendicitis. So thank goodness they didn't cut him open. So instead, yours truly saw him and I checked him for allergies and he had a little reaction to milk. He is the first case that's taught me to look at inactive ingredients in drugs. So in Lipitor, there's lactose. So there are people who say, well, that doesn't matter. It's just a tiny little pill but he was taking it once a day for six months and landed in our ER, so that caught my attention. And he was also on a diet where milk and dairy products was present. So we changed his medicine and the problem went away. So that was really a lovely case. Here's another interesting case, which is, oh, can I just mention for pills, every birth control pill has lactose. And these would be our young women who come sometime by a GI uh, department after a thorough workup for abdominal bloating or pain or diarrhea. And they don't have any gastrointestinal explanation for these GI symptoms. But taking that one little birth control pill a day can add to the bloating, the inflammation in their bowels. So back in the old days, there was one birth control pill without lactose. I looked into it called Demulin. Unfortunately, the company decided to take it off the market, which is what a shame they could have had the corner of the market. So birth control pill is a common troublemaker too. This next case is a teenager whom I had watched grow up. So I met this family when he was a little infant and he had multiple food allergies, many, many of them. He had huge reaction to milk and also beef. So the same cow. Um, and he was doing really well uh, off of these foods and he was outgrowing it. And they moved to central Massachusetts. So I really didn't see him often at all. But then out of the blue, he, he, his mother contacted me and he had developed asthma. So he was started on Advair discus, one capsule twice a day inhale. And his complaint with the sick visit was, swelling, inflammation of his throat. This was my first case. The first lesson that I learned about inhale medicine containing lactose. So he reacted, he was reacting to the milk in the abair discus 
and I have had additional patients present with similar symptoms in their throat. And it could also be change in voice quality, you know, hoarse, hoarseness of the voice. Thankfully, not complete constriction in most of them. And then what we did was for him, we switched him to an inhaler without lactose. So another really nice case where prevention, removal of the trigger helped. So how do you look up what's in inactive ingredients? I'm sure all of you know how to do this because you can Google it now that we have the luxury of having computers at our desks. So I usually go to the Rx list website and you have to bear in mind whether it's a generic or brand um, medication, the milligram amount, because it varies what's in the inactive ingredients. So here is Lipitor, you know, the first patient, Stevens, Lipitor, 10 milligram. Look at that. There's lactose, there's polyethylene glycol, and polysorbate 80. Let me now go to polyethylene glycol. Oh, so chemical agents. We talked about colored dyes but I want to now go to this case because I'll never forget this poor lady. Again, she has never had any allergies of any type and she also has never had GI symptoms. She ended up seeing our gastroenterologist here and because she was having abdominal cramping and diarrhea. Nothing showed up, thankfully, on her GI workup. She had scopes and everything. So I saw her to rule out allergy. Well, her skin test was totally negative. But what struck me was, and this is how I remember her, she told me she would usually go to the bathroom once a day, but she started two months before I met her, running to the bathroom 23 times a day, urgency and explosive diarrhea. Now that's pretty memorable. So it turned out when I dug deeper, she was diagnosed with diabetes two months before the onset of these GI symptoms. And she was started on metformin, you know, rightly so, 100,000 milligram um, twice a day. And so we Google, we looked at on our X list what's in her metformin, and it does have lactose. Then what I did was with her, we looked up, would there be any other metformin, you know, milligram wise? without lactose, and there was a 500 milligram one. So she started taking two of them twice a day without lactose, and the problem went away eventually. So if it's an essential medicine, I really respect the prescribing doctor. I would never change anything unless I get permission, but I just want to illustrate how important it is to do some detective work like this to help a patient. These days, um, well, since the pandemic started in 2020, we've gotten a lot of inquiries about the safety of the COVID vaccine and the CDC and also all of the national allergy so societies have taught us to look at, you know, ask patients, are you sensitive to polyethylene glycol, which is Miralax? Um, and the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, as you know, does contain polyethylene glycol and polysorbate 80 is in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Now, polyethylene glycol, PEG, is in the same chemical family as polysorbate. And these, are, these two chemicals are very common in medicines as well as food. Um, I had a case refer to me, I didn't make a slide for this because um, this is, I, I don't know the outcome as yet, but the point that came to my mind about polyethylene glycol is, you know, if, if there was a patient with bad hives, chronic hives, severe, that was not responding to the usual Zyrtec, so histamine receptor one blocker, she was taking Zyrtec twice a day. So she saw an allergist and she was instructed to double up on Zyrtec. And then when that didn't work, they gave her Allegra twice a day. Well, guess what's in antihistamine like Claritin tablet, Zyrtec tablet, different forms of Allegra, Fexofenadine and Benadryl, polyethylene glycol. So I'm not, I'm not sure, because I haven't done any study on this, 
and I haven't collected enough patients to say for sure. But could us, all of us, giving a patient a, an antihistamine, thinking we're going to treat the hives, containing polyethylene glycol, be perpetuating the problem of inflammation in the skin or hives? This is if the patient did indeed react to the vaccine. So we need to stay tuned as far as this is concerned. But in the meantime, again, detective work, I have come up with a table of Claritin, Zyrtec, Allegra, and Benadryl, H1 blockers, without polyethylene glycol. So if we need an antihistamine to treat hives and we suspect polyethylene glycol, we can try those medicines. So that's just a, I just wanted to make a comment about that. So what should we do for these patients who come to us and we're concerned about sensitivity or reactions to inactive ingredients in their medicines? So it could be medications that's prescribed, over-the-counter medicines, vitamins and supplements. The important thing is to be a good detective. So it's all hard work. It's just looking into it and making an effort. So usually, and you all do this, you obtain a detailed history. You talk to the patient about what the chief complaint is. And it also would be helpful to find out if they have any sorts of allergy. So for me, the allergist, I hone in on the IgE-mediated allergies like environmental, animal, or foods. And there are also sensitivities. And I was just telling John, I'm seeing so many people now reacting to chemical agents. So this is usually delayed in presentation. So it presents in adults versus young children and it's T cell mediated. It's not IgE antibody mediated. And examples that are common are people who react to cheap jewelry. So they only can wear gold or silver or platinum or they're very sensitive to fragrances. They tell you, I get migraine headaches, or I can't breathe when I walk into Yankee Candle, or someone wears strong perfume, let's say at church. And um, they can also be patients who react to latex or band-aids and certain skincare products, whether it's makeup, soap, shampoo, sunblock, and then another clue would be laundry detergent. So that would be T-cell mediated sensitivity to chemical. That's a whole nother talk. And then lastly, you know, look at what is this patient exposed to day in, day out or frequently, maybe every other day frequently as needed. So that'd be your med their medicines, their vitamin, their supplements, skincare products, and what is, are they eating? So not just are they eating, drinking milk, are they eating peanut butter, um, but also everything else, including what they put on their skin, because that's contact, it's absorbed. So bottom line is we all try to find out the reasons for people's um, presenting problems by identifying causes. You all do this. And then if we are lucky enough and able to find the trigger, then we help them avoid the triggers. So that's the preventive part and find appropriate substitutes if we need it. So I wanted to keep it short, uh, but also want to share with you some of these thoughts. And this is my last slide, which is to tell you who I am again, and you know where to find me. Okay. Thanks, Anne. So that was great. I, I want to, folks, if you have a case or you wanted to present something, Anne, we have a few minutes here. So Anne, I was, I was struck by um, your use of Rx list as your database. Uh, yeah. It's not a unfrequent, infrequent thing in my office for someone to come and say, "Hey, I've been on the Cinepril forever, and they changed the they changed the generic this month, and now all of a sudden, I just don't feel as well." I know that in the active ingredients, they have to come close within ten or twenty percent of what the brand name is. Can the generics change that much where these symptoms would would manifest? Um, and yeah, and how would you track that? I mean. It's hard, yeah. hard enough to kind of get through your visits. So it would, is there an easy way for patients or for us or yeah. pharmacists to kind of track which, which one would be a better one as a far generic Definitely. one? Definitely. And this is where teamwork comes in. I think it's worth asking the patient to help you out. So the bottom line would be, could you please 
go to your dispensing pharmacist. So if it's CVS, Walgreens, you have to make friends with them because they're all so busy. But find out what company, pharmaceutical company, makes your, let's say, Montelukas, Singular. And then ask them to show you the insert or could you get a copy of it? And then teach them how to look. It's usually under description and they'll see a chemical or we will see a chemical, the chemical structure of the active ingredient. And then just below it will be the list of inactive ingredients. But remember, you have to see, is it 10 milligram? Is it 500? Because it varies. Why is this important? It's important because this is, this, I just know this for a fact, because when we used to use Singular all the time, and it was wonderful, right? Before all the issues about depression, suicide, and mood changes, then Singular um, was sold to generic companies and nine different companies bought up the recipe. And each of them, they're allowed to put whatever they want in the filler. So this is where it's really important. And I appreciate the comment about the RX list. It's whether they keep up with it. So bottom line would be to go to the dispensing person. A little harder with Express Script, but hopefully you can talk to somebody, you know, you know would, you, something would, online. You expect, would you expect mostly GI symptoms like the Lipitor case you presented, or can they also present um, with topical and contact dermatitis um, exposure? Because of the severity, because where does the trigger go, the troublemaker, the allergen? It's swallowed, digested by our stomach, and it's supposed, well, if our GI tract's working well, it's supposed to absorb the whatever we just ate, took, you know, swallow by bloodstream. And then by bloodstream, that's like, that's the, the highway. It'll carry the troublemaker anywhere um, there's blood supply. So it could be skin, it could be lungs, it could be our sinus, our ears. And this is where that arthritis part comes in. It's, that's the chemical part and joint is so fascinating. I have a patient, if she ate potato tonight, she can't get out of bed because her right hip hurts her so much. <laughs> the next day it's delayed. That's the tricky part. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So this, again, where you know, you got to talk to people, the patient, it takes time. We have uh, a question here, which I was wondering because she did mention metformin. I'm glad uh, Dr. Yeah. Steph Resnick mentioned this. She's asking, how often is the diarrhea associated with metformin, do you think, due to the lactose issue that you brought up versus the non-additive related side effect that we all kind of uh, hear from our patients? You know, I, I actually don't know of any study. I have to look it up. I have to look up a study about it. I've got to find time to do this. But um, uh, all I know is it does happen with lactose and definitely the birth control pill. I see way too many young women come in with bloating. And then it's, do I have food sensitivity? And this is the bind. They think it's the blood tests, IgG, that, they, that I can order. But health plans won't pay for that anymore. Our hands are tied. Some of them, the health plans won't even pay for RAS testing, just to warn all of you. Because I know pediatricians and also you know, um, family practitioners who can order RAS testing. And I think it's great. But each allergen costs $50 if the health plan won't pay for it. I learned the hard way. Somebody had to pay out of pocket for it. And do you, um, just to get to some of the allergy testing, since we have a few extra minutes here, um, for the primary care doc, uh, I know obviously if there's data, you'd want it before you see them. Uh, from from all those of us who are seeing patients on a regular basis, you know, and people are coming in and asking, quote unquote, for allergy testing, um, are there panels that you like to kind of turn to or um, do you do it on an individual basis? Or how do, how do you typically do that? Yeah, I know that tests? certain labs have panels and I've seen them because I, I, a lot of pediatricians use them, but I prefer to get a good history to find out and not drumming up business at all. If anything, you'll help me lessen the load here, but it, it just makes sense to me because I've seen babies come and they, they had a panel and they're shellfish. Now, unless the mother is a pescatarian, I don't see why we're doing that in the little one. So you have to think what it, the age, everything, get a good history. Bottom line, be a good doctor, you know, and get a good history, talk to the patient. And it's, it's time, you know, John, it's hard. That's the hard part. Staying, the email helps, you know, I sure. tell them, you know, you can email me anytime. They love that. Yeah. 
you hold them tight and they let go. <laughs> well, well, thanks, thanks very much, Anne. We're going to have to have you back for another topic on allergy because it is something right. we're seeing a lot more about. Um, and Anne does practice right there on campus, and she's a great resource for pediatric and adult patients. Has been seeing my patients for close to twenty years now. So, thanks, Anne, so much for all that. No problem, uh, my pleasure. I yeah. had a good time presenting. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Take we care. We hope everyone has a, has a great weekend, and we're all rooting for the Celtics. And we'll see you all back next week. Hear about shoulder pain. Hope everyone um, takes take take it easy, and we'll see you next week. Bye.